And uh, I won't, uh, won't go into a lot of things, uh, but I do talk fast. I talk fast, drive fast, eat fast, but sleep slow. And there's some family back here that I'm dear to. It's called the Sluder family. Uh, her husband's brother Sluder up in uh, uh, Ash Asheville, I guess. Uh, that's in San Francisco of the east. And uh, but they got their four boys with them. They come down and they, I guess, heard I was at the meeting. They drove down to see me tonight. So, but uh, they snubbed their church for this one. So I appreciate that. No, uh, but it's a joy to see them tonight. And my wife Karen said to say hello to you. And uh, she's got 20 syllables and hello. She's from Kentucky, the hollers of Kentucky. And uh, but as I as I hear these folks, I know these folks. Don't know them well. But I see this lady right here. She's now a widow lady. And these kids are now orphans. The Bible says a lot about that. And I'm going to do what I can to help them. I ain't going to promise them. I'm going to show them. I'm going to give them some money tonight trying to help them. And I'm going to keep in contact with them. If, I, if he'd have died two months ago, I had a house for him in Alabama. I'd, I'd let him use it till Jesus come. Brick house. Wouldn't charge him nothing. That's what I do. And so the Lord blesses me stuff. And uh, so... I get something going in Michigan, something opens up, I'll call you. Man, singing like that, I'll call you. Especially you and your brothers. I don't want your brothers. I want y'all too right there, okay? <laughs> but but uh, I know they're going to look after their mama. They got, a, they got a hard road to go. And so, and I know this church has been a, a Paul, Paul said he was refreshed by the coming of Titus. Amen. Learn to be a refresher, not a depressor. Amen. I don't hang around critical, punky preachers. Amen. I don't care what their last name is. Tell them, I, tell them I said so. Amen. I got 50 years under my belt finally. I can say what I want to say. Amen. Amen. Great or are. <laughs> Real. Okay. I'm just kidding. But uh, I just don't care for the Baptist uh, uh, jargon. And so I'm a friend of my friends and so forth. I'm a friend I'm friend of that man on the platform. I mean that. I appreciate him. And uh, all because he uh, he knows how to dress his bright. I never can miss, miss him who he is. I, that, that, there we go. A blind, blind Bartimaeus can recognize him. I trust you. <laughs> But he knows how to eat at good places. I hate going to bad places. Bad food is, oh, that's not in the Bible. And so, uh, but I sure enjoyed being here with you. I won't be long. And so I just want to say my goodbyes to you and thank you for, uh, for helping out. The money you gave me, my car blew up last week. I brought my wife's old car in the garage to get here. I didn't want to rent one. I don't want to rent, rent the money and pay them, dude. Oh, you got to read the fine print when you read, rent those cars. Oh, the fine print. I'm glad the Bible doesn't have no fine print. Amen. Hello, no fine print. Right across the table. And turn or burn, baby. And uh, so, uh, so I got a guy looking for a Suburban for me. I'm looking for one in, on, in the auction. I don't buy nothing from the car lot. I got friends that, uh, you know, I've helped a lot of people. I've, he I've helped them in Rudy Giuliani's office, the mayor's office, Chicago, uh, the, uh, the presidential office. I've helped their grandkids. And they don't forget. I don't forget. And so, uh, but I, I have a thousand phone numbers in my phone. I never erase them. But when people tell me stuff, I don't repeat it. I was known for that on the streets, loss. Boy, I got quiet here. I don't talk. I don't talk about people. Good minds talk about things. Weak minds talk about people. Great minds talk about ideas. Depends on what you want to go for, okay? You want to stay a used car salesman all your life? Go ahead. But I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground. Lord lift me up and let me stand on place and place and where I'll stand. I forgot the word, but you know the song. <laughs> Lord plant my feet on higher ground. All right, let's go to Second Samuel. And uh, I enjoyed that meal today. I told my wife, if, if you die, I'm moving to North Carolina. She said, well, what are you moving down there for? I said, baby, the food is good <laughs> and cheap, amen. Are you saying something about my cooking? No, not yet. And um, oh, amen. I love my wife, amen. <clears throat> Second Samuel chapter 18, real quickly. Brother Roloff took a guy back in his homes 40 times into the program. 40 times. And he wouldn't quit. And the guy got, got his life turned around and got his life straightened out. I'm talking to a guy right now who was getting out of jail. He robbed the bank, for ordained independent Baptist preacher. He's getting out of prison now for 25 years. And the first thing he says to me on the phone, Brother Jack, will you be my friend? I said, why do you question that? He said, because I blew it. I said, well, I've blown it. 
she, sometimes when you blow out a tire, you blow out a tire. Whether you, uh, you hit a red light, hit a car, you know, and, and I know the sin's got different consequences. I understand all that. But uh, let's, I like what Brother Wolf said. He said, if, if you're breathing, you're reachable. He said, when the devil minds you, you'll pass. Remind him of his future. <laughs> Sucker, you're going to the lake of fire one day. And we're going to have all eternity to think about you, what you've done to us. But here's a little, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, there are stories with New Testament doctrine illustrations. And this is one of these stories right here on the doctrine of grace. And I'm glad for grace. I tell preachers, I said, quit promoting your face and promote grace. Quit promoting your place. Quit promoting your lace. Quit trying to be ace, number one. A lot of my guys are into that stuff uh, and so forth. And so I like to bring some of them pretty boys on the street sometimes. And let them talk to them hookers, no drug addicts. Yeah. And then you come to find out they're some of their kids. Mm. Hello. Amen. But see, I don't talk. I don't talk. I don't tell you who they are. You just hope I don't get amnesia. <laughs> hey, did you? <laughs> You'll catch that when you get home. Second Samuel 18. And it, uh, it, what, what's going on here is David, David is, is at the end of his life, and he's got a boy that's messed up. And he's got to talk to this general named Joab. Now, Joab was a good warrior, but he was a killer. He had that killer instinct. You want something done, get a Jewish warrior. Your top, your top of killers in the, in the world are Jewish from, from Israel. They're, from, they're not from nowhere else. They get them out of Israel. They know how to fight. And uh, over here, uh, 2 Samuel, I want you to hear what, what he's telling this general how to treat his boy. I've got people that kick their kids out of, out of church, out of home for nothing because they don't obey their mom and dad. I said, look, may, they may not obey you, but do they still listen to God? Why do you cut off that avenue? Don't ever cut somebody off. I mean, you correct them all you want to. You want to help them, it's going to take endurance. It's going to take longevity. I'm talking about broken people now. I've got, I got, I got women on the street in Detroit begging me, Brother Patterson, when you get your home, can I work for you? She's out there hooking. I said, little honey, I want to help you so bad. And I got some churches going to come out here and help you. And she said, I want to work for you. She's got a, she's got an earned master's degree in education. And she works the streets five miles from my house. But she hooked on the heroin. What are you going to do? I'm going to help her. Me and my wife get down there. We ride the streets together. So look at that one. You know that one? I know all these people. I know them all. They're by their nickname. They don't give you the real names. Now here's the message real fast, quickly. Uh, he's talking to Joab. Look at, uh, look at verse 5. And the king commanded. Now, when you broke a king's commandment, your head came off. And the king, this is David talking. And the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Atei, saying, Do you? Gently for my sake with a young man Absalom, even with Absalom. And all the people heard. They didn't say I didn't hear. Oh, did, I didn't hear you. Now you can try that somewhere else. And all the people heard when the king gave all the captains charge concerning Absalom. Father, thank you for the word. Help me be a blessing to your people. Amen. When I, when I get with people and try to, try to work with them, I have to remind myself, why am I there? Who am I there for? I talked to a girl uh, just about a few years ago. I was in a, a large city. I want to say the name, but I won't. And her and I said she was a uh, she was a hooker on the streets. I was out with a preacher late at night, about two in the morning, trying to help him feed him, get some uh, clothes for him, and so forth. And I said, "Why are you on the streets out here?" She said, "Because I'm mad at my family, and I'm I'm angry." And a lot of times, let me tell you something how to help them. A lot of times, you got to get venom out of people. They got poison in them. I'm anger. That bio in your body, medically speaking, will kill you just by anger. And that's what happened to the prodigal son. He got mad. He, got, he saw something. I know it's a story, a narrative, but uh, this right here is not a narrative. He said, when you find my son Absalom, I want you to deal gently with him. Then he, then, then he gives the next few words as a, as, a, as a right hook for my sake. And a lot of times I don't want to do something. And I got to remember that I'm not here for me. It's going to cost me to help them. You know what your biggest expenditure in life is not money. It's time. Yeah. When you put time on people, you're giving them your life. 
It may cost you those. Uh, yeah, you think I gave away CDs away sometime this week free for nothing? No, I want to put time on them. I want them to know the preacher knows you ain't got no money, but I want you to have this CD. I want you to have this plaque. Putting time on people. A lot of times a cleric dominant person like a Donald Trump, which is a great man, a cleric, they, they don't give stuff away. They don't. They, 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 they're, they're a capitalist, but they'll take gain and give it away. But different personalities have the strengths and weaknesses. You can find that in the Spirit Controlled Temperament book by Tim LaHaye, written in the 1970s. Tim LaHaye went to Bob Jones University with Dr. Pete Ruckman, and Tim LaHaye said, uh, every time I saw Pete Ruckman, he's reading his Bible. I said, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Hello, G. Wally. And, uh, you know, read, he said, every time I saw Pete Ruckman, he's reading his Bible. Uh, you know, and it's funny how these people think, well, well you're in Bible school. Hello. <laughs> And so a lot of times I go to, I, and I go to some of these churches. I hope I don't get nobody mad. Some of my, uh, my colleagues are listening online. Okay, evidence. Uh, when you, you say, I'm going to kick them out of church. Well, why are you going to kick them out of church? That's not telling them to get out of the hospital. Unless you're a pervert. No, you have to get kicked out. I'll knock you out in, in Jesus' name. You touch a kid or you touch my dog, I'll hurt you. That's in the Bible somewhere. I don't know. Uh, Book after Revelations, and uh, uh, but 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 uh, and I, I get got well I, I I got him on I got him on church discipline church discipline I said why do you guys always quote those verses I don't build my my doctrine in my ministry on obscure passages I mean passages that doesn't talk about it much they'll take three or two or three words and that's why I did it right there you're like a lawyer you're looking for loopholes. You know, you can tell lawyers when he's lying when his lips are moving. <laughs> oh, we can beat this case, but I need $50,000 up front, you know. I'm dealing with about three of them right now. They'd be glad to get me over with. Oh, man. They said, where are you from? I said, my mother, where are you from? <laughs> but here's how I did. I got I, I to gotta, I gotta assure them. Come here, little honey. Come here. Come here, Cheeks. That's her new nickname. Cheeks. Look at the Cheeks on that girl. All right, I'm, I'm going I'm to put this girl at 15, okay? I know, I know you're, you're not mean to your brothers, are you, or nothing? No, they're mean to you, I can tell it. All right, All right if this girl's 15 years old and she's on drugs and so forth, why would I want to kick her out of church? That's going on all over the country. I don't want your kids in my church so they get right. Oh, I, I got some enemies out there. Don't, I mean, a lot of preachers don't like my lollipops. Lollipop, lollipop, oh, lolly, lolly, lollipop. That's his favorite song. And uh, there's a moon. I'll get going here in a second. Um, get a job. And so, but but I got to, I got to, it's a wild night tonight. I got to, I got to, uh, do, 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 I got to bind this girl. I, I got to remind her that I'm not going to forsake her. And she's got to know in the, on the lowest pit of sin, next to God, after God, there's a preacher who thinks she can make it. That's right. I got to give her a way back. Amen. When you find my son Absalom, would you, would you deal gently with him? Would you be kind to him? That's my boy. I know he messed up, but would you deal gently with him? That's the broken heart of David. That's after he wrote Psalm 51. They got right. Amen. Amen. And why do you want to judge somebody all priests up before they got right? Oh, come on, Amen. get a life. Amen. Until their kids mess up. Amen. Then the new chapter comes in the book. I know too much. I know you do that. I know them like a hawk, man. I don't give up on them. I've had them steal my car. I've had them burn my dorms down. Had them steal my boat, pull the plug, sink the boat. I wanted to kill him in Jesus' name. Blah, blah, blah. Jack, you be kind now, son. You be kind to him. He put his arm around him, pray with him, and, look, and then look at him, wink at me. He's, All right, now, Jack, take over. You be kind to him. <laughs> I want to kill him. He's <laughs> taking a brand new boat in salt water. But they tried to run. But the little teenagers need to have, they need to know that you're not going to forsake them when they make a mistake. That's what David was saying. Deal gently with them. Thank you, Putin. Thank you. And then he says this. For my sake. You know what he's telling Joab? You owe me. You owe me. You owe your preacher. You owe your parents. I see these little girls. I've been talking to them all week long. I see y'all trying to find yourselves. What are y'all looking? Oh, how you can tell that? I can look at you. 
Now, I, I, I like the friends. I, like, I love the slutter boys back there. The other, all the little slutter boys wearing suspenders. <laughs> Uncle Jack does. You better watch out. Little kids are watching you. Right. Be an influence to them. Learn their name. So when they get 15 or 16, some punky boy can't talk them into doing stuff when they're at work when you're not around. And your grandkids. See, I tell you when you get conservative, when your grandkids get older, you'll think different. That's the message. This parallels with 2 Corinthians 5. Paul lays it all down there. You, we're going to work for Christ. We're going to get the judgment sheet of Christ. That whole chapter, I won't go into it. My time's up. But uh, no illustration, just nothing. I just wrote this thought down. And let me just give you something about, about a, one of my heroes named Fanny Crosby. Uh, she was uh, looking for a place to get buried at. And uh, she uh, uh, went to her cemetery, and over here she felt Barnum Bailey's statue that's 35 feet tall. And she said, I want none of this. Then she goes over to another great statue. I forget it. It wasn't Barnum Bailey. It's somebody else, and it's about 40 foot tall. Oh, Tom Thumb. 40 foot tall. Talk about insecure. <laughs> And then, and then watch this. And then, and then Fanny Crosby, when I first saw her, her, uh, her grave marker, it was it's a block about as big as this right here. And it's on the ground like this. And it said, it says, Aunt Fanny. On the front of it said, she have done what she could. 40 foot, 50 foot, Fanny Crosby, who wrote Rescue to Perishing. I teach my kids in the program, and I say kids. Some of, them, some of them are still 40 years old. They're still kids. They hadn't grown up yet in their mind. I teach them church history. It's history. History is his story. It all starts at our time. Our clock right here start, comes off of Calvary. comes off when, when Christ died. That's when our time started. You don't believe in God. Well, then quit telling time then. But I'm done, preacher. And... Uh, she, uh, she went to the Bowery Rescue Mission one night, Fanny Crosby, and I'm done. They talk about dealing gently. I can, that's, not, that's just an introduction. About, I'll, maybe I'll come back one day and finish it. But uh, she, uh, she, she got to uh, the, the mission that night, and somebody preached, and uh, they gave an invitation for, to, to people to come back. A lot, a lot of people came back to get saved that night. And she's blind, and she's in the back room winning people all by herself. Nobody came in an hour's time to help her to win people to Christ. That was a great Fanny Crosby. She was so mad, she went home that night. Blind people get attitude. And uh, deaf people even do. Mm -hmm. I hear them all the time. But it's funny to see a deaf guy on heroin, man. It's, it's rough. But, uh, but Fanny Crosby, the streets is funny, man. It's a zoo out there. I laugh. Man, I laugh. I know the Lord laughs at their calamity. He laughs too. And... Uh, but Fanny went home one, that night and she wrote, Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings like very that grace can restore, touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is mercy for Jesus will save. That song was written out of our broken heart that night because somebody wouldn't come and deal gently with somebody's boy. They wouldn't come down. They were too busy doing their things and with the time of the day. And I got to watch I don't get too busy that I don't deal gently with people that come across my path at a truck stop, at a park, at church. At a restaurant. Amen. It could be a widow lady broke down in the, in the driveway. God's going to bring people across your here. I'm done with this statement. God, God's going to bring people across your path to see how you deal with them. Remember the old saying, what goes around? Hello. Be not deceived. At, 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 at the negative verse written in a positive context. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. What are you planting down for the future? What are you planting down for your kids? What are you planting down for your family? I was at work. I'll just say this. I was at work at uh, Blomox making tanks, and I went full-time back in the ministry back at Howell's Anderson Days. 
and I had over 100 guys came to my say goodbye party. And one of them was a Muslim guy. He said, Patterson, I hate your guts, man. I hate everything you stand for, but I like you as a person. I'll never forget that. I like you as a person. I said, I don't want to see you in hell one day. Uh, I couldn't get his name, so I always called him Salami. <laughs> he had a name about that long. I just called him Salami. And uh, he wasn't going to do nothing. And, uh, but he said, I like you as a person. Now, there's a lot of Baptist guys. They, 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 they get they'd argue with them all the time. Paul said he reasoned with them in the scriptures. He didn't say argue. He reasoned with them in the scriptures. I had scripture signs up by my tanks. I had, uh, you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, and so forth. I had my area clean. I got, I get my work done about uh, three hours before day, the shift's over. He, the foreman says, I can't have you here at the run. He said, go evangelize. He was an old drunk. He said, hey, man, get out of here. Go evangelize. Go help somebody. When a man's ways please the Lord, even his enemies are at peace with him. By the house, I, I, I will say this to you. Uh, uh, the, the fellow, the J. Frank Norris, used to fight all the time. Oh, by the way, J. Frank Norris got paralyzed at the age of eight. Somebody shot him in the back. His mother told him, he said, you'll, you'll never preach. You'll never pass your church being, in, being crippled. He learned how to walk by the age of 11. He got, he got out of there. Lester Roloff went to hear him preach one time. Lester Roloff was eight years, 11 years old, and there was one chair open on the front row. J. Frank Norris' church ran about 7,000 in Fort Worth. And Lester Roloff grabbed the usher's chair. And, uh, and, and the usher come back to get a, a seat, and Lester Roloff wouldn't give it up. He said, I'm sitting down here. He never seen Jay Frank. All he heard him was on the radio. They drove an hour to get there in a car just to hear him preach. And Jay Frank Norris said, what's that boy doing on that front row? He said, he come to hear you preach, and he won't leave. That's my seat. He said, any boy wants to come hear me preach, set him up in my chair. And Amen. the little Lester Roloff went up there, and little old farmer clothes set in the seat of, wow. seat of J. Frank Norris. I am writing a book. It's called Every Day a Diary. It's coming out. I'll hopefully get it out within a year before the rapture. You can have it cheap after the rapture. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, you better be going with us. But I'm trying to tell you, while I, while I learned to ministry with my two Germans, Pete Ruckman and Lester Roloff. Pete Ruckman was taking street preaching on the streets, preacher. And street preach. Hey, Patterson, how you going? What are you doing? I said, oh, these, these people are hungry. And I, you know, I, I was in school working. I think I made two bucks an hour uh, sheet rocking back in the 70s. And uh, said, well, here's 20 bucks, man. Go buy some water burgers. He said, man, alive. Now you got me down here feeding these people. And every week he come down, he, every time I saw him, he had extra money on him. He, he said, hey, I like this. He said, he said you're going to do something with your life, ain't you, Patterson? He said, won't you stay here and work with me at the school? I said, no, I'm going to work for Brother Roloff. He said, well, that, that, that's a good place for you. Go there. They try to talk me out of it, you know, to keep me at home base, like some of them do. You need to listen to me, you know. You need to listen to him. Yes. And, uh, but that's where I learned all this stuff at. There's more caught than taught. Keep your eyes open. Father, thank you for the message today. I just pray you to take this uh, little truth. I'm looking forward to hearing Brother Danny preach. And uh, Lord, help us to deal gent uh, gently with people, kindly with them for your sake. And I don't know, sometimes I can't do it. I don't want to do it sometimes. I get frustrated. I get mad at him. But, Lord, I do it for you. And Paul said he was a debtor. He owed something. Thank you for that life. I love you, Lord. Thank you for this church. May this light always shine for Jesus Christ. Brother Pastor. God, he said some things that will help us. They're going to sing a song. You better be careful with your attitude toward people that are not right with God. we all been guilty of it, ain't we? I've seen people get out of church and maybe get in sin. Christians walk right by them, not even speak. I've had it happen to me. There's still people who walk right by me and won't speak. That ain't the right kind of attitude, y'all. That ain't the right attitude. That ain't what the Lord would do. The Lord won't do that. Go ahead, y'all. If you got anything you need to pray about, let's do it right now. I've not always been faithful, but he has. Yeah, man. I've not always, I've not always been, been faithful. faithful but Tell you one thing, brother, he has. He has. He has. And I've not always been true, but he's always come through. He 
says I am. I say I can't go on. He says I can. And I'm not loved every something just quick for about 10 minutes before we go I wanted I didn't know Brother Jackson will stay tonight and I had some people this morning say hey, we want to hear you preach and I said I will preach something tonight so that's why I'm doing this uh, other than that I want him to take the whole service so let's do this turn to Ecclesiastes 12 let me just tack on something what he said what he said just now is worth a million dollars y'all I'm glad I got in on the tail end of those old preachers like that. I met, I think I met Brother Jack in Pensacola at Rockman's Church when I was preaching down there in the late 80s. And um, there's a picture of me and him somewhere, and he's got us like this. Dr. Rockman's, he's shorter than I am. He's got us like, like two little kids. Uh, but... Uh, uh, Dynamite comes in little packages, what I've always heard. So uh, anyway, um, I'll say a couple things right here. And I want you kids, please listen and take our advice, please. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12, look at what it says, verse number 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. Enjoy being young. Walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Now look at 12.1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth 
while the evil days come not, and they will come, buddy, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Now, you know, a few years ago, I did a thought like this, and I want to give it to you because about 90% of y'all kids wasn't here. Here it is. I'm going to tell you three things that will get a teenager out of the will of God, and neither one of them is a sin. Three things that will get you out of God's will and mess up your life, and neither one of them is a sin. Think about that. See, the devil, when you're really right with God, the devil knows he ain't going to say, hey, let's go get drunk. I mean, that ain't going to work. So the devil will use something that ain't wrong to get you wound up doing something that is wrong. I'll just give them to you right quick. Are you listening? Number one, teenager, getting a job. Getting a job. That ain't wrong. Matter of fact, it's right. Lord, I hate to discourage y'all from getting a job. God knows we need some kids that'll work. And I got one person that says that uh, my, my son's a miracle worker. If he ever works, it's a miracle. Uh, but do you know what? Listen, I've been, I've been preaching to young people ever, for some reason or another ever since I was 19 years old. And I got to preaching youth meetings, youth meetings, youth meetings. Youth meetings. I thought, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what to do. And I, so I thought, well, I watch them. So I watch hundreds grow up. Hundreds grow up. And you begin to see a pattern after a while. You go to church, you come to the Lord, you get saved, you're 8 or 9, 10, you're 11 years old. Then you get 13, 14, you get a good dose at camp. You really get on fire for God. And something happens when they get about 15. When, teenage, when they get about 15 years old, something happens. Yeah. And then driver's license. And then, and then jobs. And all. So getting a job can get you out of the will of God. Illustration. I've had this happen so many times it ain't even funny. I guarantee you. And these are before they get to that, what he's talking about, people out on the street. Teenage girl comes in on Sunday morning. She's 16. She goes, Brother Danny, Brother Danny, guess what? I got, guess what? And I said, what? She said, I got a job. And I go, oh, gosh. She said, why aren't you happy? I said, I, I, I don't know. I, I said, I, she said, no, it's not like that. It's not about, it's at McDonald's. And she thinks I'm going to be happy about that. And I said, now, you know that that ain't going to, you're going to miss, no, 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 no. I know what you're thinking, preacher. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I've already, ain't this what they say? I've already talked to my boss man, and he says, I'm only going to have to work two Sunday mornings a month. Now, if that was true, and it ain't, that's out of church half the time, uh, two Sunday mornings out of a month. When you're 16, you don't need to be missing no two Sunday mornings a month. Lord, you don't need to miss a prayer meeting. You need all you can get. And, it's a, and, and that's why some of them's in the shape room when they're 30 and 35 and 40 and messed up. It all started back there, 16. Listen, they was kids that did not come to this youth rally because they was working. Sometimes you have to. I ain't, I ain't belittling work. God knows we need some kids that'll work. And I said, oh, no, please. She said, I've already talked to my boss, man. I'll tell you what's going to happen. First two weekends, you're going to be training because nobody don't want to work on the weekend. So they train you. That's two. That third Sunday is your scheduled Sunday to work. That's three. Then the fourth Sunday, all the center girls got out and got drunk last night, and they called the girl to come in on Sunday because she That's four. And ain't nobody going to miss four Sunday mornings of church and stay where they need to stay with God. Not me, not you, not mom and daddy. Brother, we need it. God, we need all this we can get. You need every service you can possibly get. We don't need to miss nothing. We need to listen to preaching in your car. You need to listen to preaching on your phone. You need to get you that you can possibly get because the devil is working 24 hours a day trying to ruin you. She's out. I'm not trying to discourage you from getting a job. You want to get a job this summer? Fine. I'm not discouraging that. But you get you better make sure you know what you're doing. You better have some talk with your parents. Mooch off of them for a little while. 
<laughs> You're going to get all you want one of these days, ain't you? You're going to get to work all your little heart wants to one of these days real soon. You're going to get plenty of it. Ain't that right, Mom and Dad? Yeah. So I told her this. She said, I said, why do you have to work? She said, so I can pay for my car. I said, why you got to have a car? So I can get to work. I said, you're a nut. I said, now let me get this straight. And she's looking at her. She said, now please don't start on me. I said, let me get this straight. You got three things. You got school, you got church, and you got work. That's right. That's right. Now you can't do all three of them. It's obvious. So something got to go. And guess which one goes? Church. I said, why don't you quit school? I can't quit school. Well, you're quitting church. You think school is more important than church? I don't. I'm going to tell you, Chris, school. I'm telling you, wait till you can do it all and serve God right and do it the right way. Yeah. Do it the right way. Somebody go out of here and say, Brother Danny told the kids, no, I didn't say that. I said, you can't do three full-time jobs and wait till you can do it right. Well, you can do it right. Amen. Pizza up, same way. There's kids that didn't come to youth rally because they worked. And they thought that makes it all right. They think, well, see, God understands. It, it, look, it ain't God that needs a youth rally, y'all. It's you. It's you. You need it. Getting a job. Make sure you get a job that you can still serve the Lord and put God first and honor Him. And there are positions that people have to. There are nurses. There are uh, policemen. There are jobs where you have to. I understand that. I ain't stupid. But, brother, you better tell you what you better do. You better say, my spiritual life is the most important thing in the world. My spirit, my walk with the Lord is more important than school, job, or anything else. Number two, there's three of them. The second thing that'll get a teenager out of the will of God is joining something. Joining something. Sports. Basketball, football, uh, volleyball. Oh, uh, I mean, just anything, anything. Uh, uh, they say, even in college, some of y'all ain't gonna like me for saying this. People online, they, I, get, I get people been mad at me all the time for saying this. But I'm gonna tell you something, people. College is one of the most evil, wicked, ungodly places on the face of this planet. Secular college, brother, will absolutely ruin about 90% of the kids who go there. We worship education, worship money in this country. I'm not against education. I'm against wicked education. I'm against dormitories with 18, 19 year olds and they're shacking up and learning how to live wicked and to be professors teaching them the Bible's not true and losing their faith in God. Uh, that'll, that'll ruin a child's life. Now listen, I've got girl, two of my girls sitting right over there tonight and I got three girls tonight. They're all three saved. They all know the Lord. I'd rather them not be able to write their name. And they can't hardly. But, and and be saved by the grace of God and know. Yeah, they can too. I got one of them over at the smartest college professor. She taught teachers at school the math problem. And I'd rather, seriously, I'm not kidding. I'd rather not be able to spell like my son-in-law. <laughs> True, you think I'm kidding? and be saved and right with God. I said, I said what grade is Dax in? I don't know. <laughs> Brother Danny, your grandson don't know what grade. I don't care. I don't live right. I don't live right. I'm going to tell you something all your parents are going to get mad at me for. I didn't ever use anything that I learned past eighth grade. If you can read and write and multiply and divide, I know y'all hate this, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Has anybody had to use algebra since you graduated? I mean, any normal person. The only person that had to use algebra or geometry or some fool thing like that is if you're going to be an algebra teacher. I'm not saying quit, but education ain't God, y'all. Education without salvation is damnation. We tell our generation to worship education. 
Listen, you, if you can read and write and multiply and divide and subtract and know sentences and know where to put your accents on, oh, Lord, I know that stuff when I was in eighth grade, not even paying attention. You know how I learned how to re- le- pronounce the words in the Bible? Listen to Alexander Scorby, brother. <laughs> and and Ruckman, all them, you, they, they, they finally say Philemon. They finally say Habakkuk. When I first got saved, I called Habakkuk Habakkuk. I did, really. I said, oh, it's over in Malachi 310. Malachi 310. Bring all the ties in the storehouse. <laughs> Look like Malachi. We called Job Job. It still looks like Job. I have to, I'd have to know somebody had to prove me that really means job. J-O-B, job. Girl not long ago went to Chapel Hill and called her daddy and said, Daddy, I don't believe in God no more after a semester at Chapel Hill. Chapel Hill is the beer drinking capital of North Carolina, y'all. It's a hell hole. I know people get mad at me. You ought to get in line. There's a lot of people in front of you. I'm not preaching against education. That ain't education. Making drunks and whoremongers and, and, and atheists out of kids, that ain't education. That ain't education. Third thing. Last thing. I'm through. You know, you can get a lot in 15 minutes if you say something. Number one, getting a job gets you out of the will of God. Number two, joining something gets you out of the will of God. But the worst thing that will get a teenager out of the will of God, you already know what it is, somebody tell me. Falling in love. Oh, my God. How do, you, how do we begin to say? How do we begin to say? How do we begin to say it? Because it's natural. A little boy, when he gets big enough, naturally likes a girl. He better. A girl, naturally. You heard about them two little boys, Brother Jack. You know, they both belong to the He-Man Woman Haters Club. That's the way little boys are when they're five, six. Ah, girl, shoo, get them out of here. But something happens when they get 10, 11. These two boys, they hated girls. They hated all girls. And about that time, a pretty little girl about that why I walked by, and he said, you know what? When I quit hating girls, she's going to be the one I quit hating first. <laughs> That's normal. It's natural. And they ain't, I have, if I've seen it once, I've seen it a hundred times. A teenager come on to church, get on fire for God, sit on the front row like these are, love the Lord, open the Bible, and, I, and then first thing you know, she comes in one Sunday. She'll come to Sunday school that day. Just moseys on in at 11 o'clock. And sits back on her back and got something stuck on her arm right here. His looks like his hair looks like an explosion in a steel wool factory. <laughs> How many stations can you pick up on that, man? Uh, his legs look like a rope with a knot tied in them. That's what my daddy used to say. My daddy always said his legs look like a rope with a knot tied in them. He had to tease hair on his leg to make his socks stand up. He runs around in the shower trying to get wet. But oh, he's so hot. He's got zit, yellow, and on his face. And she says, look, Brother Danny, ain't he cute? I said, Lord, I want to throw up. They popped that thing like mayonnaise on him. On him. I mean, good Lord, people. And she thinks he's cute. I tell you what the girl's problem is. Just like he said this morning, a girl falls in love with what she hears. She says, oh, maybe you're just a pretty thing. I just love you. <gasps> you feel like that about me? I love him. There's your problem right there. Now, girls, I, I don't expect all y'all to listen to this because they never do, but if you want to listen to Brother Danny, listen to the old man right now. Right now. If you feel yourself starting to like the wrong kind of boy, you better do everything you avoid him, 
Don't make eye contact. Don't answer his text. Don't, you better get yourself off right then because once you let yourself fall for him, you start doing dumb things and making stupid decisions and doing stuff you would have never done before. And all God people said, it's true, it's true, it's true, it's true. See, if you'll cut it off right then, you might be all right, but if you let your, you can feel yourself falling, can't you? I mean, you can feel yourself. You, can't you feel yourself when you start falling in love with somebody? You can feel it. You better back up and look at his daddy because that's going to be him in a few years. <laughs> you better look at her mama. She won't only look like her. She'll act like her. Eventually. You say, now wait a minute, I don't want that, I don't want that. I'll tell you what, you better quit, fool, you better quit playing with it then. You stay up and text, type the night, text, you're, you're, you're just going. And then once you fall in love, then you start making excuses for him. Well, no, he ain't, he ain't all that, but I, I'm more, he's, I've got him coming to church. Look, if that's the situation, if you, gotta, if you have to drag a boy to come to church and then he looks down the whole time, and he won't leap, he won't be pulling you more. You you'd be better off without him. He ain't no help. He gonna be no help to you. Amen. Story. Young lady come to church several years ago, got saved. She's about seventeen. This is a true story. Cheerleader, high school. I won't say which high school. And her and her friend got saved. And she came. And they sat right on the front row. Back then, all the young preachers sat on the front row and all the young ladies sat on the second row praying for one of the preachers on the front row to maybe like them. And this girl did. She sat there with her Bible and every time I preached, she'd just go. And I mean, I mean, just eating it like a little bird, you know. You throw them, they're just eating it up. And I noticed one Sunday or two, she wasn't there, Brother Jack. I won't say her name. Might have kin folks around in here. But I didn't see her for a while. And then one Sunday she came. And she came in late, missed Sunday school, sat in the back, some big old boy beside her. I said, Who's that? And they said, That's her boyfriend. He's a football player. He's all the girls like him. She's she's a cheerleader. He's a football player. Perfect. Oh, it's heaven on earth. Our dreams have come true. That's what you think when you're that age. When you're 15, 16, 17, and that first boy pays you attention, that's the most dangerous time in your life. A lot of us could tell you about a lot of mistakes we've made. But going down that same road and letting our flesh lead us instead of the spirit. Amen, people? And then I didn't see her. One day her sister called me. She was crying and she said, Brother Danny, pray for, name her name, pray for, name her name. Said she's pregnant. Said she's gone to Asheville today to have an abortion. She said, we don't want nobody to find out. The school won't know it. Her friends won't know it. And she went to kill that baby. That wasn't what she had planned. That wasn't what she had planned. She had planned, oh, we're going to be in romance and live forever together and be happy and be madly in love and he will meet all my needs. That was, that's a dumb way to think, y'all. Ain't no man going to meet all your needs. The Lord's got to do that. As he said, there ain't no woman going to meet all your needs. The Lord has to do that. He's the bread of life. And you know what? She had that kid killed, murdered. I don't mean hurt nobody. It's probably people in here that done that. I ain't trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to help these girls to see it like it is. And they jerk them arms and legs off them little old babies. Throw them in a the trash can. Over 4,000 every day in this country. You think God's going to bless America? <laughs> buddy, we're in trouble. And you know something? Every time after that, when she'd be in the grocery store, She'd see a woman with a little baby on her shoulder like that right there. She'd think, I wonder if mine would look like that. I wonder if mine would have those pretty little blonde curls, the pretty brown eyes and blue eyes. I wonder what it would have felt like. She lived with that. She's lived with that now for over 25 years and never will get over that. You know why? Because she 
fell in love. And as far as I know right now, that girl never served God since. She fell in love. And, and I ain't fussing at you because, I mean, we're supposed to do that. All I'm asking you to do is when you feel your stuff start liking somebody, you feel it. You can tell. You can tell when you're starting to, oh, my goodness, oh, boy, I'm starting. If they're the wrong kind of person, just go ahead and hurt. You say, I don't get my heart broken. Sometimes you better off break your own heart. Break your own heart and hurt and get it over with. Better to hurt now for a while than hurt a long time later. Get it over with. And that's what I want to say to you tonight. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray right now for all of our teenagers and young people in here tonight and those that are watching on the road and traveling and homes and online and other, other states and countries that every one of these kids... Lord, that they wouldn't let our mistakes be stumbling stones to them, but stepping stones. That they wouldn't make the same mistakes some of us older people have made. And I pray you'd give them enough sense and enough grace to make up their mind right here tonight that they're not going to let anything or anybody get them out of the will of God. She's playing softly tonight. We've had four or five invitations over the weekend. This is the last one. She's playing softly. I wonder how many kids just get down here and say, Lord, by your grace, I want to try my best. I'm not going to let that person get me out of the will of God. Others, others, come on. Teenagers, mamas, daddies. Amen. Lord, by your grace. That's right. Come on, young people. Come on. Let's get in this altar and say, Lord, by your grace, by your grace. Can't do it on my own. I ain't strong enough. God, by your help, your grace, Lord, I'll do the best I can. If you'll help me, help me not to make do stupid stuff that I'll regret one day. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. God, I do pray for this gang of kids on the altar tonight that you'd bless every one of them. Help them, Lord Jesus. Help them, Lord Jesus. God, they've been exposed. 95% of the kids in America have never been exposed to what they've been exposed to this weekend. God, help them not take it for granted. Get down in their heart. Make it real. Help them to love you and serve you. Do what ought to be done in their hearts. Now we're praying tonight. We'll take just a few seconds. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen, y'all. Praise God, y'all. Bless your heart. Amen. Amen, Miss Kim. I thank God, Miss Kim, over there. Raising them three kids. And Katie. Amen. Praise the Lord for all y'all that are here. You're here because you're hungry. Justin, Amanda, and Opie, and Hannah, and all them from Florida. These folks back here from Asheville. Friends from days gone by, Bruce, raise your hand back there, brother Bruce, Lisa, and Amanda, her family. You know why we're here? We're here because we know there's a God and we know He can help us. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm in church tonight because I believe that. I believe it with all my heart. Amen. So I'm still praying tonight. Man, I don't know when I've enjoyed a weekend like I have this week. I'm, I'm tired now. I went home, laid down this seat, and I didn't. Well, I woke up and I didn't know where I was. I don't ever do that. I ever. I don't. Usually, when I'm asleep, I'm not really asleep. I woke up. And I'm like, oh, what day is it? Oh my goodness! Time to go back to church. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm tired when I do that. I'm tired. I don't know what tired feels like. Uh, once in a while. All right. Everybody got what you needed. Anybody want to stand up and brag on the Lord?
Take your time to do that right now. It's going to take one minute. Then we're going to have our, our ushers come for our regular Sunday evening offering. Go ahead, Brother Darren. Come on, ushers. <laughs> 